Good afternoon, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the ISA seminar, The Sheathed Sword, From Nuclear Bring to No First Use. Today, we are delighted to have with us as the guest speaker, Lieutenant General Prakash Menon, Director, Strategic Studies Program, Takashila Institute, India, and discussant and chapter contributor, Dr. Rajesh Bashur, Senior Fellow, South Asia Program, S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, and Research Associate, Contemporary South Asian Studies Program, University of, of Oxford, England. I shall now invite Dr. Yogesh Joshi, Research Fellow, ISAS, to deliver the welcome remarks and chair the session. Dr. Joshi, please. Uh, thank you, Shavanya. Uh, welcome you all uh, today afternoon. Uh, so, Shavanya did a very brief introduction, uh, but if you want to uh, even think about what all uh, left in general man has done, uh, you know you would have to go through pages and pages of uh, introduction in a sense. But let me introduce both the book and left in general man in, in a in a way I saw him uh, as a student. Uh, one of the best ways to acquaint oneself with scholarship of military generals is to read what they wrote not after their retirement, but when they were in active duty, and especially before they take a staff rank. I therefore have been an avid reader of military journals, of the Indian military. So the USI journal, the United Service Institution journal, is one of the oldest journals, is openly available. I think the best stuff is published by the Combat Journal uh, and by the Army Training Command. One of the most interesting pieces on the intersection of nuclear and conventional strategy was an article published in 1999 uh, in volume 28, issue two of the Combat Journal called Conventional Dilemma in the Nuclear Age by a relatively young colonel. And that is one of the best pieces I had read on what India confronted after the 1998 tests. And that young colonel no, was no one else but Lieutenant General Prakash Menon uh, at that point in time. And therefore I'm not surprised at all uh, when I look at the sea thing short uh, from nuclear bring to no first use, which is the book uh, and the, disc the topic of our discussion today, which Lieutenant General Menon has edited uh, and contributed to. I think he's one of the most prolific scholars the Indian military has produced. And this book could not have come at a more opportune time, especially in the light of the general nuclear anxiety in the world, which endangers out of multiple factors increasing use of nuclear weapons for coercion rather than deterrence, dismantling international norms, regimes, and trust fostered by great power competition, which otherwise broke the destructive and dangerous patterns of arms races during the Cold War, and even after, the lack of trust uh, in the credibility of nuclear security guarantees in alliance dynamics, the intersection of emerging and disruptive technologies, which may shift the balance of terror, which defined the nuclear age to a serious asymmetry in nuclear vulnerability between states. All these factors, alone or in combination, does create a picture of nuclear doom. The central argument of the book, therefore, underlines the rising danger of our times, uh, that nuclear weapons will be employed due to some combination of miscommunication, misjudgment, misperception, and sheer accident. The book brings together some of the most stellar scholars and analysts on all things nuclear. We have one of the most eminent scholars who have contributed to this volume, Professor Rajesh Bashrur. For any in audience interested in nuclear politics and strategy, uh, Professor Bashrur requires no introduction. I don't think we could imagine someone more experienced and learned to carry us around this brave new world of nuclear anxieties as General Manon and Professor Bashrur. Without much ado, therefore, I pass the floor to General Manon. Uh, after his initial presentation for 30, 35 minutes, I would request Rajesh uh, to not only talk about his chapter and other contributions, but also something which is a pr very prominent theme of this book, uh, but also a prominent work, uh, prominent theme in his own work, the idea of no first use, both globally as well as in the Indian case. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Joshi, and uh, thank you for coming and giving me the opportunity to be here. It's an honor and a privilege. Uh, before I start, let me present a copy of the book to Isas and uh, thank you so much. I do it with pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. 
So, I'm going to tell you about why is this book published? Who are the people who have written the book? And what does it generally say? So, to answer the question, why is it published and why is it published now? In actual fact, this, the ideation for the books comes from my personal experience in the Indian nuclear system and about military machines when they interact with each other. And the fact that I am quite convinced in my mind that nuclear weapons, along with climate change, actually are the greatest dangers to humanity itself. A fact that gets recognized only sporadically. Climate change, of course, definitely is the longer term. But both can be in combination. So the book was conceived somewhere in 2018. I have shifted out. I was in government for uh, practically 45 years. Uh, I then decided to be a teacher because that's what I like. That's what I do now. So I went to Takshila. And then I gave the idea to Nitin Pai, who was the founder of Takshila. Nitin Pai, incidentally, is an alum of this institution. You know, he's an engineer who's also done a post-graduation here in public policy. And so actually Takshila is connected to in US. And then we discussed that we need to actually bring this because there is not enough public consciousness about the dangers nuclear weapons actually, uh, what do you call, uh, threaten humanity in a way that is unimaginable because people don't have it in them. Only very few people who have been part of the system would probably wish OK, it's good to have them. Let's hope nobody uses them. That's the general. And I'm sure at least that has now been acknowledged even by politicians that, you know, you, good to have them, don't use them. So there is a, uh, a dilemma here. Why do you have them if you can't use them? So that's what the problem is. So we put this together. And we wanted to raise the consciousness on one thing which can be done as an initial step towards safety. The final and the ultimate would be abolition of nuclear weapons, but that's not going to happen. And we all know that, con considering, unless, of course, somebody uses nuclear weapons and then there's somebody else to recover the world from what has happened. Until then, we know very well that that's not going to happen. But we can do certain things which is possible to do. And Therefore, we saw no first use as a declaration, a pledge, and eventually, if we can, a global no first use treaty to make, take the first step towards safety. We know very well that this is not, uh, because this is the only possible practicality which is there. Why do we say this? Either this will come about, probably, if nuclear weapons are used somewhere. Or this, after use, there's people left behind who can actually bring this about. So one of the two is we don't have to wait for that event to happen. We cannot remain comfortable in the notion that nuclear taboo has uh, been kept alive for more than 70 years and expect that it will continue to do so because as geopolitical tensions rise around the world and as we have seen how Putin waved his nuclear weapon to not at Ukraine so much but at NATO to tell them that don't interfere here. Of course, he's walked back later in the Waldai Club statement which he made but the fact remains that this book is meant 
to highlight what we think is an impossibility today and we hope that people we, it will be ready when it is needed so the idea is of placing the book before the event or even after the event hopefully only a certain amount of nuclear weapons will be used and then people, you know this is already ready there so that's the idea of the book the second thing is about who is written here the book has a total of 21 contributors 21 across the globe from all nuclear weapon countries apart from nuclear weapon countries of course we have got and, and, and I must say that out of these 21 authors and some of them are actually uh, there are 21 chapters about four or five of them have got two authors I mean they are co-authored two authors during the time when they after they wrote this chapter passed away and one of them was Colin Gray who I think all of us know should know at least I'm a great admirer of him and the, uh, the second was a lady called Emily Lando. She was an Israeli. She wrote about Israel's nuclear weapons. Both Colin Gray, of course, was 77. He was not well. I personally knew him. Uh, Emily Lando was young. She was 59 years old. And uh, sudden she, again, I think both of them died of com medical, sudden medical complications. So two authors are no more. So these 21 authors from different parts of the globe nuclear and non-nuclear states are the ones which we invited to write and they have written in four part the book is in four parts the first part is about understanding gn F N F nfu in the world order what is exists and rajesh has actually contributed so have i in that so has colin gray the other one is about the dilemmas of nuclear weapons. That what dilemmas that nuclear weapons pose. And the third part is about the challenges of NFUs. What challenges does NFU pose? And the last one is of authors talking about their own state or the nations which they're writing about, whether it is Chinese or whether it is a, a, a Japanese guy or Korean or a Turkish um, or Israeli, writing about how does that nation, as a, uh, how do they look at this notion of no first choice? This is, the, this is how the book has been structured. So what has people, people written is what I want to actually tell you. Uh, Colin Gray, I must start with Colin Gray because the point that he makes is that what ties strategic behavior is the common thread of common cultural parents, he calls them, which, which in, in translated we mean that the commonality of human nature, that we can be the angel and the devil, and I can move it in between. So we should not be content with the fact that nuclear weapons have not been used because in the hands of human agency, and the types of people who are probably responsible for them, anything can possibly happen and it is better that we take steps to s ensure that it does not happen. The world order, as we know it now, is already slipping. Frictions are increasing geopolitically. Definitely none of them is going to even listen to you about nuclear no first use not at all but for the reason which I told you why it is important to keep that argument alive the dilemmas of nuclear first use no first use has been dealt with and from America I don't know how many of you have heard of her her name is Nina Tannenweld she has written about her views of why US and why no first use should be actually adopted, which is 
antithetical to the prevailing official norm. But let us not forget that President Obama was very close to declaring a no first use policy for the United States. It was only the Pentagon, guys in uniform like me, who cannot possibly think that how can you talk about no first use because to a military mind, not hitting that guy first and allowing to be hit first is anathema to how we are brought up. But the problem is, that is when you think of it as a military weapon. And what I actually write as about, I call it a military think. Because the nature of nuclear weapons, not only its destructive power, its ability to dis cause destruction on a scale and time which is so small, but scale is very large, makes it different from the rest. It cannot be considered to be. Of course, technology is now pushing and making smaller and smaller weapons to make it more usable so you actually expand the borderline between conventional weapons and nuclear weapons, and it call it tactical nuclear weapons. And that is why, in India at least, we do not believe that there is anything which you can describe as a tactical nuclear weapon. Because any use of any nuclear weapon will have strategic in effect. It will be the first time nuclear weapons are used. The whole world will go into a panic. and. If it is going to be used against another nuclear power, and if we think that that nuclear power is going to reply in kind, and they will keep exchanging these small-scale nuclear weapons, then I'm afraid that people don't understand what Clausewitz described as the power of escalation caused by friction, probability, and chance. I mean, it's OK to have a theoretical concept that you know you can control escalation. You can't even control escalation even in a small gunfight so easily, believe me. I have served enough in Kashmir to know that. Once one guy fires a, a bullet, then fear, uncertainty, and the very fact that survival is at stake here, you're not a human, normal human being. To expect our leaders to be normal and take decisions rationally according to certain graphs and intelligence inputs which are not very clear is hoping for the impossible. And in any case, let me tell you, if nuclear weapons come into play, where do you think the political leaders are going to be? Because the first thing the nuclear system has to protect is the command and control system. That means that these leaders will be either airborne or inside some deep underground shelter. And if you have been to any of these, you'll realize that these cannot be normal people here inside in, in normal times. So you will have people making decisions on escalation based on uh, uh, what do you call the fog of war, impossibility of knowing what the other side is going actually trying to do, what is he trying to uh, communicate. He can go anywhere. So this idea that escalation can be controlled because tactical nuclear weapons won't do cause much damage itself is an insult against military realities. And I speak as an uniformed officer who's been in part of that system. So the dilemmas of no first use are, is that the main dilemma caused, and most of the people who've written about it, especially from people who belong to countries where, who enjoy what you call extended deterrence. That is, they don't have any nuclear weapons, but they are protected by US nuclear weapons, entire NATO for that matter, Japan for that matter. And uh, I, I hope, I don't know how much of you know, when Obama was going in for no first use, one of the first nations which protested against no first use by the Americans was Japan. Because Japan is extended, 
enjoys extended deterrence from the US and says that if, if that is taken away, then we are vulnerable because we don't have a new nuclear weapon. So there is an argument here that if USA does not protect all these European nations, then all of them will go nuclear and the world will get more, more dangerous. But the problem is with the, with the concept of extended deterrence, and that's this. It is incredible to believe that a nuclear power will protect another nation by use of its nuclear weapons first and put itself at risk from another nuclear weapon power. Not going to happen in the real world. I mean, these are good constructions. Uh, human imaginations which gives some sort of a thing but the Japanese also would certainly be in doubt but these are not problems which can easily be solved probably there's an argument in saying the world is much more peaceful because of excellent deterrence or much more safe because less nations have it because US protects all of them because more, more, the more nations who have it and then there's more danger so there is an argument there but the problem here is that extended deterrence is now forcing even the prime nuclear actors to stay on with first use. And what is the problem with first use? You know, one of the chapters in the book is actually uh, uh, already published report by a group of scientists uh, who is uh, Toon and a couple of others who have done a study on the effects of just 100 nuclear weapons exchanged total between India and Pakistan. The effect of the nuclear explosions, which is not about the immediate effect, the long-term effect, is that when nuclear explosions take place, and especially since you know most of our urban areas have got a lot of energy packed in them, and because of the fire, the dust, and the smoke which will go up into the stratosphere that block the sun, and according to the scientific models which they have, the, the, it will finally affect, cross the cooling of the Earth's temperature, and it's called, known as a nuclear winter, because these, these are things which came out in 1980s it was uncomfortable for politicians and strategists to deal with this because nuclear strategy is based on this notion of first use. So even if you use it first and manage to destroy all the nuclear weapons of the other power, the long-term effects, which is about blocking out the sun, the dust, and the smoke, it, I mean, the, 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 all your bias systems, agricultural systems, especially if it happens in South Asia, all the agricultural systems, even in China, and all the surrounding areas, it'll, even Africa, will all get affected. When that gets affected, when the food systems and the water gets polluted, what are human beings going to do? They're going to fight more, right? So the social uh, uh, unrest which it will provoke itself might be the end. So the, the idea is that nuclear strategy which has been devised to keep the, the whole, whole concept of nuclear deterrence alive and try to convince that you don't use it against me because I'll use, I'll use it against you, are, has always been on thin eyes of logic. Nobody really knows what will happen after the first nuclear weapon is fired between nuclear powers. Nobody knows. So the idea that you can use this first against another nuclear power and get away with it doesn't make any sense. Therefore, no first use has uh, uh, at least the closest step. Because what does no first use do? It reduces your alert level. Otherwise, especially during the Cold War, even now between the, the Americans and the Russians, the amount of nuclear weapons which are on alert to be fired at short notice is still unimaginably high, unacceptably high. Why? Because the military won't allow it. Military says that if you don't, the idea is, if, if that guy hits you first, then before you get hit, you should be able to hit him back. I mean, this is the logic, you know. 
and when you look at the number the num the, the time available for a political leader to make the judgment that you've been fired at and now you must let go all that you have is hardly anything especially when he is inside some bunker on or in an aircraft it doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any practical sense so one of the things nu nuclear first use does is it, it can bring down your alert levels it can make it safer because the uh, the greater the alert level the nuclear weapons are more ready so whatever you might say in whichever context you see it no, no nu nuclear first use treaty would is a small step and this is only a pledge it's only a policy you in a crisis anybody can actually violate it all that there is no there is no guarantee here that people will keep their word but it is one step towards making sure that at least during times of tension forget about war you don't make a mistake the issue really is no first use today in today's environment is unthinkable yes let me you can plus not because of anything else because of the state of geopolitical relations because we must understand that it is not the nuclear weapons which are the problem the problem is the state of political relationships unless you resolve that and ma 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 major authors make this you can tinker with nuclear weapons but nuclear weapons are a product of that relationship unless you sort that out and you know nuclear weapons powers have been always maintaining nuclear war should not be fought cannot be won they, uh, they 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 pay every time they go to the united nations because they committed to actually abolition of nuclear weapons in the non proliferation treaty but that's just lip service everybody knows it so the point is that we know that this book for a guy who believes that in the today's world it's not i mean it's not even worth reading we are saying you read it now because it will come in use later that's what this the value of this book is and among the authors most of them say the same thing the question is how will we realize this before or after that nobody can predict and we ho only hope it is not after so i have taken my time and uh, i am afraid that i don't have any copies of the book to this thing but it's available on amazon uh, let me hand you over to my good friend professor rajesh basroor General Menon, it's always difficult to follow in your footsteps. I will do what little I can. Let me begin by thanking you, of course, for you know generating the idea that led to this book. But let me also thank uh, Dr. Sevia, my dear friend Yogesh, and indeed the institution itself, ISAS, for. Uh, organizing this session. Uh, let me start by saying that actually uh, nuclear issues are pretty messy, far from being as clear as they sometimes appear to be. And to get so many authors together is tricky because uh, most of the time we don't agree with one another on so many things. I certainly don't agree with several of them. Uh, and. Uh, Maybe uh, General Menon and I will do battle on some of them on another occasion. Let me start by being a little skeptical because uh, you know it seemed odd to me, and I don't mean to start um, by being too negative, but <coughs> it seemed to me odd that Colin Gray had the first chapter in this book because uh, he's pretty famous for saying that arms control happens when it doesn't really matter. Nevertheless, I do think it matters. 
So, uh, but let us also recognize today that why we feel the need to be uh, need to uh, go ahead quickly with something is because there is no institutional uh, kind of arrangement to deal with the complexities of the Cold War era. Uh, it's not so long ago that there was so much optimism at the end of the Cold War when uh, it was said that, you know, the future can be a global zero. And uh, somebody got a Nobel Prize for talking about the possibility seriously. Uh, but let us also recognize one thing, and that is that the notion of a global zero was underpinned by a subcutaneous reality that many in the United States, with its huge lead in advanced conventional weapons, figured that perhaps we can do without them because we have something else, which nobody can catch us catch up with us on. So that's something that must be keeping kept in mind, that when nations want to agree on something, they do it out of their own interest. And where that interest really lies is something we need to investigate very carefully. So pushing for a global no first use uh, uh, mechanism would be actually uh, quite uh, remarkably challenging. And yet, and yet, I would fully agree with, Dr. Uh, with General Menon that it has to be done. Uh, <clears throat> the fact is that we live in a world of intensifying competition. You know, so much so that people now talk about the good old <coughs> the good old days when the Cold War was stable, which is pretty absurd considering if you have read anything about the Cuban Missile Crisis. But nevertheless, the fact is that, you know, nuclear competition has grown steadily, and it is now being made more and more complicated because we have the entrance onto the stage of new technologies which are actually accelerating and complicating the whole process of decision making and of actually carrying out any sort of deterrence policy. So I think the arms control agenda started dying soon after the end of the Cold War again, because the US with its triumphal kind of understanding of having won the Cold War uh, did not really feel the need for uh, further pushing the arms control agenda forward. So. <coughs> Today, the two main achievements of the Cold War era are pretty much dead. That is the ABM Treaty and uh, the uh, INF Treaty, uh, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty and the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. And the arms control strategic agenda between uh, involving Russia and uh, the United States is pretty much uh, stagnating. Okay, and at the global level, as uh, General Menon said, you know there is a uh, super ambitious treaty for the prohibition on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, a sort of nuclear ban treaty, as it's widely called. But this treaty, as General Menon recognized, is so far into the future that it's uh, more or less uh, something that we cannot think of as practical uh, in the foreseeable future, at least. So what is left, the point is, there is almost nothing that is on the agenda today which deals with the two kind of uh, antithetical tendencies, the two big antithetical tendencies. One, the increasing uh, competitive politics among the major powers, particularly in an era of power transition where you have one state in relative decline, the United States, and you have others which are rising, China first, but uh, India somewhere further behind, and Russia trying to revive. 
So in this complex mix, you have an intense competitive politics. All these nations are nuclear powered states, okay? But the one antithetical reality against all this is that no one really wants to fight. That since 1945, no state with nuclear weapons has entered into a major conflict with another state with nuclear weapons. So what we have is on the one hand, highly competitive politics, on the other hand, an intense interdependence with the consciousness underpinning it of our survival as a society, as a human society. So how do you bridge this gap or this oppositional gap, so to speak? And the only way it seems to me that this can be done you know, is what is actually being attempted more seriously with regard to something like climate change. If you go back, say, 20 years ago, Nobody took climate change very seriously. Okay. But the interdependence which has created increasing problems has generated some movement towards, however difficult it may be, some movement towards a resolution. So there is an organization, there are meetings, there are discussions, all this is going on. But what's happening on the nuclear front? Nothing, almost nothing. So what this book represents is not something that you know, is going to happen overnight or very soon, but it is something that needs to be brought up, needs to be put on the agenda. And the fact that you are able to get a bunch of authors, many of whom, if you look carefully, are fairly hardline realist in their approach. Okay. You have to bring them together and start talking about an issue which you cannot simply, you know, treat as if you were an ostrich. Okay. So for this reason, I think uh, the GNFU, uh, as an effort to manage this profound contradiction and create a modicum of institutionalized stability, an initial movement towards it, is something that is really to be appreciated. And I think the best thing that you have done, Dr. Me uh, Dr. Menon, also is right, General Menon, is that uh, you have been able to bring such a large, you know, tap into such a large uh, catchment area and to bring together so many people from around the world. That is something which is very difficult to do. I mean, you do have m big meetings by people like Carnegie Endowment and so on, but they don't do that. They just bring more of their own kind into the picture and they deal with it as if it can be solved. Mm -hmm. But this is the beginning of a long up uphill climb, and I think uh, you know it is laudable that you have been able to do it. And as the system becomes, I mean, the, the complexity of the politics becomes even greater. There are quite a few uh, problems that are yet to be brought up with regard to dealing with the complexities of nu nuclear politics or with regard to uh, you know, how to uh, deal with the process of change. Uh, one of them, for example, is how would a no-first-use position uh, respond to a devastating cyber attack on a nation's command and control system? We have had people writing in the past about attacks on a command control system, inadvertent attacks also, which are part of a direct uh, kind of uh, kinetic assault. But we have not had much discussion on how, uh, you know, as some of you may have read that there were reports, in fact, the government of India is said to have stated that there, were, there have been at least three significant attacks on the Indian parts of the Indian electrical grid okay, uh, in the last uh, several months. Now, what if they were really a major attack and which kind of blacks out a major part of the country, including Delhi and the command and control systems? Is that something you can handle under no first use? I don't know if the question has been deliberated with there. 
So there are a number of things that do need to be done. Okay. The fact, let me close by just one minor point, and that is that the Cold War era saw the beginnings of nuclear arms control only after a couple of really serious nuclear crises where there was mobilization of nuclear weapons. And those were the uh, Berlin crisis of 1961 and the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. And only then did the two major nuclear powers start talking. Okay? So I just leave us with a thought that maybe you know, it is important to reflect on this. Do we really need a crisis before we start, start taking this business seriously? Thank you. Well, thanks so much, General Manon, as well as uh, Rajesh, for that excellent overview of the book, but also kind of targeting that very specific point on no first use. Uh, um, British historian and strategist Michael Howard had once compared nuclear strategy, uh, you know, which is basically about how to win or s survive a nuclear war to theology in a sense that you can only know the truth about existence of whether you can win or survive a nuclear war or existence of God only in your afterlife. Uh, in some sense, therefore, but the book, I think, is not about nuclear strategy. It's not about winning wars or defending wars. It is about the central question of the nuclear age is avoiding nuclear wars. Uh, and in that sense, I think, uh, even when both nuclear strategy and theology are very abstract uh, you know, ideas uh, with real consequences and lifelong quests, uh, I think the central question of the nuclear age uh, should be to avoid a nuclear exchange or a nuclear war. And the book basically answers, in some sense, that question with a very, uh, you know, a very real impetus on uh, no first use. Uh, before we move to the questions, I just want to kind of take your view on two things, uh, which I think in some sense uh, not only speaks to you know, your expertise, uh, but also in some sense I think would enlarge the discussion so far. One is you know, the emerging technologies and the pressures they, they bear on nuclear strategy, both for deterrence and compellence, but also war fighting. Uh, you know, is the balance shifting from the balance of terror uh, towards nuclear war fighting and winning nuclear wars, and how do you kind of foresee? You know, uh, Rajesh mentioned the idea of cyber, you know, AI for that matter, hypersonics, all kind of emerging technologies, and what uh, they do to our con conventional thinking on nuclear weapons and strategies. Uh, I think that would enlarge the debate. The other thing which I would like both of you to kind of reflect upon, uh, not only because you know uh, it's much closer. Uh, to, to in fact to your practice as well as policy, but your scholarship as well, which is how do you see the India-Pakistan uh, nuclear context, the larger conventional nuclear uh, you know, context, as well as the India-China one? Uh, you know, and that would be very, very beneficial as well, in a sense that from a very general premise uh, on, uh, on, on all things nuclear, coming down to those very focused regional issues. So, uh, emerging technologies. Yes, technologies, especially within command and control systems and within the military systems which uh, to deliver, is constantly being bombarded by new capabilities that seem to increase accuracy speed and in some sense miniaturize nuclear weapons. So the idea that technology is now making nuclear deterrence more complicated is true. But it is true because people believe that one gain or a, a new function of which has been discovered gives them a sort of advantage which make, can make things happen like 
uh, in this, there's a chapter by two Americans called uh, Keba and uh, Daryl Press, who believe that with the improvement in technologies, it will be possible to target quite precisely the counter force, which means nuclear weapons of the other side. This is the argument that, that they make. True, possibly. <laughs> but the only thing is, if you, if you target that nuclear weapons, the amount of nuclear weapons which you have to use to target all of them, then you get into a nuclear winter problem. So it would be actually, eventually everybody will die. It will be, you know, it, uh, it will be uh, the sentence which is, I think, is right as suicide for the fear of death. That's what it would be. It would be a contradiction in terms. We must understand the thing about military use of technology is that technology is contestable. Rajesh spoke about the fact that one of the things, the greatest misdeed of the United States is actually pulling out of the Ballistic Missile Treaty. Because the Ballistic Missile Treaty was at least provided mutual vulnerability. If you hit me, I could hit you back. That was the mainstay of the deterrence equation. Once that treaty was actually came away, now everybody is developing a lot of technology to pierce each other's defenses. So you have what do you call number of weapons, you know, 10 weapons on one missile, or you have hypersonic vehicles or hypersonic glide vehicles. But the other guy is also doing the same thing. So eventually what happens is, in military terms, technology chases its own tail. So everybody is now trying to counter the other. And that this is a, a, what eventually happens is you keep spending more and more of your energies, your resources in developing things, but it will all be contested. And, and, and the fact that Technology pro can probably see better and so on, but don't don't forget that the other guy on the other side, maybe knowing that because you're looking, I can deceive you by doing certain actions which you cannot understand. So this is a problem with the notion that technologies are going to change. It is definitely changing, but it is also definitely making it dangerous because not because of the technology itself, because people believe that they will gain an advantage if they strike first. This is the problem as far as the technology is concerned. Uh, Indo-Pak and the Indo-China context. As far as the Chinese are concerned, and us, uh, both of us are no first use pass. We have a slightly different view on no first use. But basically, in a sense, we believe it's a political weapon. So do the Chinese believe in a political that so far, although there are indications that the Chinese are now building missile silos, and you know, therefore anybody who's building missile silos cannot be a no first use power because missile silos are the first thing going to be targeted. If you're a no first use power, you will have all your your weapon systems because you have to strike back after being hit, which will be either mobile or hidden in such a way that you cannot be hit first. If anybody is making a, a missile silo, that means it is thinking of also using it first. I mean, this is the logic which can be used. We don't know about that. But now, at least till now, China and India are no first use path. We have had these border conf confrontations. Not a single whisper of the nuclear equation has figured. Both countries have not even touched it. So I don't think the nuclear equation in terms of India-China matters. But what matters is China's nuclear arsenal is growing to react to the Americans and the West. Because the arsenal is reacting to the West, the Indians watch that arsenal growing and the capabilities that is deriving, and therefore have to take measures to ensure that it deals with those capabilities. So there is an equation which gets mixed up. Pakistanis watch us. We are reacting to the Chinese. Pakistan reacts to us. So again, technology is chasing its own tail. Everybody is trying to see as to how they can. So as far as the Indo-Pak equation is concerned, since 
every time we have a small even a small issue the first thing which pakistanis normally do is to call for the meeting of the nuclear command authority it will be advertised and they say that we have taken stock of everything we are ready what do they want to do and that's the use of nuclear weapons because that's all how it can be used you inject the nuclear equation into a situation which is either ongoing confrontational or where there is a limited conflict and pakistan does it all the time what is it doing it is actually attracting attention to the bigger guys to say ki please this is the most dangerous place on earth you better intervene this is how pakistan has been using its nuclear weapons of course now we are now in a situation that after the last uh, balakot strike where we used air power against them uh, we have now the situation is that the indians seems to have made a bold move escalated a little everything finally got sorted out but there is nothing which guarantees that you can start the process again and hope that it will happen like the one which has happened before so the danger remains but india is quite confident we are too big pakistan is a small nation i mean the geographic size the population itself they might have, they might say they have more nuclear weapons than us at least most of the western writers seem to think that pakistan has got no weapon nobody knows i mean the fact is i don't know who's doing the counting and how they're doing the counting but they have ways of measuring it but i can assure you that it's not an accurate measurement whatever it might be it's difficult for any anybody else who's trying to conceal his nuclear weapon for somebody else sitting in a university to find out from open sources about what nuclear weapon how many nuclear weapons are but there is but there are people who calculate uh, we are not worried about the numbers because india believes that as long as our weapons are survivable our command and control structure survivable that's good enough for deterrence to prevail so you can expect that as far as the indo pak situation is concerned whenever there is a problem the first thing pakistan will do is to call attention to the nuclear danger which prevails <clears throat> i think i more or less agree with what you say i just feel that you know with regard to the india pakistan relationship there is a, i think there is one at least surface level problem and that is that pakistan believes that first use is essential for a state which has a weaker conventional force okay so the assumption is that there will be uh, if there is a conventional war between pakistan and india where well, pakistan has no choice being the weaker state to actually use nuclear weapons first so on the face of it that seems pretty logical and the problem with nuclear issues is there are different logics depending on which one you pick and choose to employ at any given time so for instance we could resp respond to this previously stated logic by saying that why would you expect that india and nuclear armed power would go to war against another nuclear armed power and hope to get away with it whether they have no first use or whatever you know as i said earlier since 1945 no two nuclear powers have entered into a major military conflict with each other so this logic tells you something else it's not going to happen and nobody wants to commit suicide by saying thinking we have the advantage second thing i think to go even deeper i think the real problem in dealing with opposition whether it's from pakistan or whether from the us or india or any other place dealing with opposition to an no first use uh, uh, treaty such as that which has been proposed is that there are two basic logics in operation with nuclear weapons one is that deterrence works when you are certain to make it work and i am certain that i will make it work and my enemy is certain the other logic is that deterrence works on the fear 
generated by the risk involved where there is even a small chance of something huge happening. The reality historically has been that the risk factor has constrained everyone. But the reality, unfortunately, is that in thinking about nuclear weapons in the discourse that happens in many parts of the world, it is that certainty is more important. So the consequence is, unless you resolve this contradiction, you, know, you are going to face opposition, whether from Pakistan or from anywhere else. Thank you. Uh, so we are open for questions. Please identify yourself uh, before uh, you ask your question. Hello, uh, I'm uh, Imran. I'm a research fellow here. Um, I wanted to ask a question about um, sort of the uh, aftermath of uh, the use of uh, nuclear weapons. You, you know, you talked about you know the decision, the heightened s state of the decision uh, making that's taking place, maybe deep underground or in the air. Or, um, I, 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 it's, I, I suppose I just want to know, um, you know, what other considerations w would we need to be aware of I in such a situation of, of what that situation might be like. Uh, so. Uh, let me ask you to use your imagination. So there is, let's say, the highest decision-making political body in a democratic country, or maybe if it's authoritarian, there's one man who probably takes a decision. But they're all in a safe place, which I said could be either in the air or they could be deep underground. And uh, what would happen is they need to be told what's, what's the situation like. So they're probably getting inputs, intelligence input from various sources. Uh, so somebody is drawing a picture. There are guys who are making the assessments, telling the political leaders this is what is happening. This is what we think that they are doing. Uh, and if alert levels are actually the ones which seem to play, there are different alert levels and different actions need to be taken by the nuclear weapons powers. So those actions, some of them you come to know, some of them the intelligence will spot, some of them will be uh, interpreted correctly, some of them would be interpreted wrongly. Remember, distrust, fear, and uncertainty is the ambience which prevails. It's a psychological atmosphere. In that atmosphere, even intelligence inputs, even the, the uh, let's say, the interpretation of satellite photographs. All you know, that guy might be trying to deceive you by making certain movements which he wants you to see, because that's part of his operation plan. So the question then is that you have political leaders unhinged from ration rationality or from ability to think rationally, and bombarded with information which they can't figure out whether it's true or not. And if you have dealt with intelligence agencies, you'll probably realize they never make a firm commitment. They always will leave things in a little bit of gray. So the political leader will be neither, you can't be very sure it's here or here, it's somewhere in between and those guys will be confused. So to think that Everybody knows what the other body is doing, and that is exactly why I quoted Clausewitz on friction and the fog of war. This is, in Clausewitz times, it was normal conventional war. Here, you are in an ambience where you are talking not about your own extension, the extension of probably your nation itself. I mean, you just see the scale of the psychological atmosphere. Or, 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 the, or, or the, the, the very tensions that we create. Decision making in that, this thing, we, do, we simply don't know how, what sort of, the, you can either freeze and say I won't make a decision, or you can actually go crazy. Between these two, so now you place yourself in a situation that this weapons have lost complete guidance of political rationality. That's the problem. 
weapons are supposed to be used to achieve political objectives the problem with nuclear weapons is the moment it is used it loses touch with the guidance which political rationality is supposed to control you know clausewitz has this famous triangle on the escalation thing in his book in which he has three corners the top corner is about the prevailing emotional state of hatred and hostility between nations the other one corner is about political rationality which fundamentally in this case is about so how do i survive and the third one he calls it probability and chance and then he says escalation is like a magnet suspended in between which is being pulled by these three forces we don't know which one is stronger the thing is human agency is not in control that is what we have to understand so that is the issue so to say like you know the 34 steps to escalation which was which certain theorists have actually sold that this is how you should escalate uh, and so on they're okay for boardrooms not in the practical world it don't work firm sorry yeah. hi i'm shila panasami from main guard international we are a risk management firm based here in singapore my question to you sir is thank you so much for you know the wonderful delibera deliberations um, you mentioned obviously the military and the political um, implications the decisions that are you know military and politically led i was just wondering about the commercial and economic motivations for uh, the decisions behind the use uh, of nuclear or the no first use? Yeah, actually, uh, uh, I think it was which president of the United States who talked about the military industrial complex. The thing, the scientific, the technological push about developing new weapons comes from the scientists and the industry which obviously seek political, where the money is there to the government. They are the ones who actually are the ones who are pushing in the name of security. It means they, they say that if you do this, if you use this technology, you make these products, you will be more secure. The argument is of making yourself secure, okay? So the problem with this is it's not a unilateral process, it's a bilateral process or a multilateral process because other guy is also looking at you and you are advertising these products because you want to frighten him for deterrence to prevail. He is wondering, oh, that guy's got it, I better have something better or at least have something to counter. So it's an action-reaction cycle where the commercial end is very much present and pushes this and it's unstoppable because the interest groups are so strong. You know, just uh, I think uh, the new stealth bomber which the Americans have advertised. You just have a look, I mean, for those of you interested, go and look at the uh, cost, the, the rough cost which they're talking about. You know, very few nations can afford it. But the fact is that there must be a massive interest group behind that bomber because for them, it's commercial interest. So that's how it works. So to answer your question, beyond the problem of no first use is the problem of the fact that there are also commercial interests which are pushing. They don't push for no first use, they push for first use because technology is trying to actually prevail in first use. Also, uh, the, the conditions under which, which was Imran's initial question, the conditions under which political decision makers would have to take those decisions regarding escalation. Uh, with regard to the <coughs> making of decisions, I think uh, a tricky business. I mean, there was one uh, individual who was working in the White House Situation Room, and he said, "You know, there's no time. All I can tell the president is." red, yellow, and green, you decide. You know, it's, it's that kind of situation where uh, there is no time to re react. We don't even have enough information. 
there is not just well uh, general menon spoke about the fog of war there is equally the problem of the fog of crisis because you simply don't have the kind of information on which a rational decision can be made as regards commercial uh, i think it's hard to see i think uh, the role of commercial interests in generating uh, support for one particular uh, weapon system or another also depend on a number of factors but most of the studies that have sh come out seem to show that this is quite strongly prevalent in the united states uh, one because it is fully commercialized production of weaponry but second and this is something that is not often recognized that in the us the dis uh, final i mean sort of policy decisions about what is to be approved spending and so on are made through a checks and balances system in which there is actually uh, often a disagreement between the uh, executive and the legislature sometimes the executive wants to spend more and the legislature does not sometimes it even works the other way around so they both have to agree and commercial producers have developed a skill of exploiting this system for example you if you look carefully at many of the big weapon systems and i wouldn't be surprised if that applied to the b21 uh, stealth bomber also what the commercial interests do is they distribute the contracts and subcontracts across as many states as possible and then put pressure on the legislators from those states and through the public on those legislators to then go and put pressure on the executive so uh, that's not something which you are going to see happen in pakistan or india or france or anywhere else as much so it does happen but it is not such a widespread phenomenon in my understanding uh hello general melan uh thank you for a wonderful lecture uh, uh, and hello to uh, professor basrul also uh, my name is khyati i am an alumni of takshashila institution so i am your student so happy to be attending this um my question is uh, what is your sense about the changing polit political situation of the 21st century i think as you know there was this understanding that developed in the 20th century about uh, managing this uh, no first use and you know what was th this understanding about the dangers of nuclear weapon do you see that understanding uh, in the politicians as well as the people in general eroding do you see, sense that or uh, can you just elaborate more on that thank you I think we must understand that the parents of nuclear weapons are the state of relationships between nations that dictates and has spawned nuclear weapons if relationships are okay no problem but the world today and as you as we see it and we are witness to it is in a state where relationships between nuclear powers between non nuclear powers are increasingly getting more polarized fractious and hostility and hatred seems to be gripping the global system even within nations the othering of communities and so on is on the increase lot of communities and nations are living where they don't like their neighbors because their neighbors don't belong here they belong somewhere else according to them this is the general state of affairs of the world in such situation and where hostility and hatred is coming to be greater in its pervasiveness relationships are getting very bad so going forward unless 
a political leadership sees the dangers which exist and unless the powers that be which actually have these weapons with them and realizes the dangers which they have and change course there is no you are moving actually into a much more dangerous place than ever before because it's not that national interests don't matter it's a question that people themselves are now electing more leaders who are authoritarian in nature who power depends upon othering rather than uniting all this makes it very complicated in fact i i i've just um, last month or maybe a two months ago published an article on the china india pakistan trilemma that's the, this thing in one of the disarmament uh, the thing it's published in tokyo where where i where i have said that one of the problems now is the types of leaders which are being elected to power who now have their hands on these nuclear weapons after all you look at what trump i mean look at the way trump dealt with nuclear weapons i mean the way he threatened north korea of course north korea just should this and then we knew the power of nuclear weapons because he was a small guy who hardly had any nuclear weapons then throwing two fingers to the power of the greatest nuclear weapons in the world so it itself showed that why wouldn't a country which does not have nuclear weapons believe it is better to have some nuclear weapons than we won't get blackmailed or threatened so the danger now is and as rajesh was saying there is no see the entire arms control and disarmament agenda is now in disarray because people don't have the time and they say that how can you possibly do it i mean after all colin grace this thing about arms control was he called it the arms control paradox that you can only do arms control when you don't want it when you want it you won't have it it's like life itself when you have something you don't want it when you want it you don't have it so i'm afraid that that's why the book is is, is placed for bringing out the dangers in the hope that people will see it or at least when some crisis or something happens then people will at least read because the views expressed here come from a global uh, authorship who's expressed different views not that they don't want it most of them say we want it but we 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 won't have it because we know we can't have it it's not about weapons it's about the leadership and humanity itself it's about human beliefs it's about human imaginations and always says that you can't make a difference sure nothing to add any other questions so, yeah so well, i have like quick questions now uh, yeah okay uh, and then i just have uh, oh, oh claudia sorry oh sorry yes, sorry no, no, i just no, have no. a very quick question um so we know that in march right there was a accident about the brahmos missile so i was just wondering uh, it did not seem that india has responded uh, properly they did not offer to compensate the damaged properties and they just fired off their own staff in charge of that i was just wondering this doesn't seem like a very confidence building approach that they have with the pakistan and in future do you think that um they will continue their confidence building approach to understand each other better and to prevent the use of nuclear weapons or such mismanagement of a certain event will happen again and escalate it thank you Just take all the questions. Yeah. Okay. 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 Right. Ramita. Uh, thank you, General Menon, and uh, also thank you, Professor Basru. I'm Ramita. I'm a research analyst at ISAS. Okay. To quickly ask my question, uh, it's on the relation that you drew, the parallel you drew between uh, climate change and nuclear weapons. Uh, Professor Basru, you also spoke about uh, having similar negotiations. So I'm curious about how do you see this panning out? Like, who do you see as uh, an a potentially acceptable rule setter in this regard, and uh, what are the kind of incentives that can be provided for countries to cooperate on these issues? Thank you. Uh, and the last question, the gentleman in the front. 
Hi, I am Gandhar Desai. I am a former student of uh, General Menon uh, at Takshashila and also a recent uh, postgraduate from NUS uh, in public policy. So my question is, uh, you know, what what influence do the potential use of uh, nuclear weapons by non-state actors, you know, how does that influence the discourse around no first use? I mean, supposing a non-state actor you know, carries out a nuclear attack and the government of the day attributes it to a state actor, then, you know, and retaliates, does that constitute first use? And kind of what is the thinking around uh, this issue? Thank you. Okay, quickly. Just very quickly to Prof. Rajesh, uh, because uh, General Menon, you mentioned that- Your name, your name. Oh, I'm Rajni, I'm a researcher at uh, ISAS. Uh, General Menon, you mentioned that um, there are these spillover effects of first use of nuclear weapons on food security and such. And then you also mentioned about how the military usually ends up chasing its own tail. So the expenditure on military tends to escalate. So then I was thinking, Prof. Uh, Rajesh, that you were talking about how the conversation on climate change issues, that's become quite mainstream and there's a lot of political will behind that, but not on nuclear issues. But another topic that a lot of political conversation is happening about is social inequalities. That's kind of dominating the discourse as well, the Great Reset and all of that. So I'm wondering where you think or what, at what point you think that there could be a gr greater social push for countries with nuclear weapons uh, for these, these conversations to actually take on more importance. Thank you. Okay, let's start with BrahMos. Yeah, BrahMos missile without a warhead was accidentally fired off from the Indian territory, it landed in Pakistan. It happened as an accident. Nothing, there was no damage, fortunately, in Pakistan. Um, it took some time for the Indians to admit that this had happened. Could have been faster. There was no danger of any escalation. Although Pakistanis, as usual, quite rightly, after all this cannot be ignored. And the Indian defense minister accepted that it was our fault. That is why I'm telling you that I have dealt with these military systems. All sort of funny things can happen. In spite of various levels of checks and balances. In fact, all safety systems suddenly, some one small guy does one small mistake and it goes off. You know, I, I, I normally used to, and probably he'll say, I used to give an example uh, for teaching uh, on this idea of that you can take, we're having a military parade, you take all the precautions, everything goes off well, this thing, and suddenly during the parade, one dog runs through the parade. Where did it come from? How did it come? Or a monkey goes through it. This is the problem with military systems. And fortunately, since no damage has taken place, and I'm sure that they would have said that we have taken care of it. It just shows that there is a certain amount of maturity between Pakistan and India which has developed over a period of time that uh, did not cause Pakistan to retaliate. Hope we would have learned our lessons, they would have learned theirs. That's the problem with the whole thing about military systems. You know, uh, if I tell you some of my experience when I was in counterinsurgency, all sort of funny things happening of when, let's say, there is a this thing between terrorists and the armed forces. It's, you can't believe because that's how it is. And I think Clausewitz captured it very well by, by you know, calling it probability and chance. So that was the first one. Then let me take on the second. No, I think you can, uh, yeah, the non-state actor. Uh, what is the question about the non-state actor, which, uh, My question was on uh, what uh, Professor Bashir spoke about uh, having similar negotiations like climate change for nuclear weapons. So on uh, what country could probably be an acceptable rule setter and what kind of incentives can be offered to the countries so that they cooperate on this? 
No, uh, I think what I was referring to was your oh, question. So okay, basically. right. Okay, well, I got it. So, so the thing first. Firstly, this thing about non-state actors getting hold of nuclear weapons. Okay, let, let, let's first. Uh, this used to be and is. You know, nuclear weapons are not something which you carry in a suitcase and then you give it to somebody and that guy. I mean, there are complex systems, and even I'm sure. Uh, any country, including Pakistan, they are very, very careful about who, how it is secured and who can get hold of it because they know there are enough people in their own country if they get hold of the nuclear weapons, will use it in Pakistan itself. So this notion of a nuclear weapon getting by non-state actors, of course, nothing can be ruled out, but it's, it's very remote, first I tell you. So the possibility is of a dirty bomb. Now, what is a dirty bomb? It's about nuclear material, which is available, where you can use conventional explosives and spread radiation. Those cannot be equated to a nuclear weapon because it doesn't have this sort of uh, destructive scale. The question which is asking is, what, what if a nuclear weapon is used by a non-state actor and somebody, and we blame it on the state because that's what India has said, India, nuclear, as far as our nuclear doctrine, anybody who uses nuclear weapons against us, we will retaliate. The only exception we make in our doctrine is that we retain the right to retaliate if biological and chemical weapons are used against us. Whereas in our doctrine, we say that nuclear weapons, we will react. In case of biological and chemical weapons, the wording is, we retain the right, which means it's not definite because that is because you know biological and chemical weapons actually belong to completely different baskets, although we try to put it in the same basket. So I think if because uh, we as long as it comes from a state and we have enough proof that it is from that state, I and mean, if it's a nuclear weapon, doesn't matter who whether it's a non state actor or whether it is part of this thing, in according to India's nuclear doctrine, we will retaliate. That's how it is. <clears throat> Let me just uh, attend to both the questions from uh, Ramita and Rajni. I mean, uh, back in sometime in 1987, I was uh, I visited the uh, uh, United States States uh, uh, Nuclear Command Center in uh, uh, Omaha in the U.S. And uh, one of the people who was my host is actually, ironically, an undertaker. Uh, Told me, uh, told me that you know I asked him yeah, you know you're sitting on the first target in the Cold War okay how does it affect your thinking he said we don't think about it because that's the easy way out uh, and there is really nothing much you can do about it why I said that it's because I don't think the push for change is going to come from the public uh, like uh, nuclear disarmament movement and so on which is in any way pretty weak everywhere. Uh, I think the push will come from above. But unfortunately, you have to think about what context will produce that push. And from what little has I've seen, I would say it would take some sort of a crisis to generate that push. I think this, the value of this book lies in being ready for such an event and saying this is what you can do, rather than producing a discourse which will then lead to a kind of push. You know, thank you. Sir, can I have a last question? Yes, okay. please. Very One quickly, yes. Very simple. Yes. Sir, you referred about a monkey suddenly entering the scene. And what if the monkey is North Korea? In the present context, how do you look at it? <laughs> uh, le let's put ourselves in North Korea's place. North Korea, actually, nobody is threatening the territoriality of North Korea. North Korea, South Koreans feel that the North Koreans might threaten the territory. So, you know, the equation has to be very clear. If you were in North Korea's place and if you are being threatened by a nuclear power, wouldn't you like to have nuclear weapons so that that guy will stop threatening you? After all, Trump, after his threats, went and came here to Singapore. In fact. Wanted to have a deal. 
If North Korea was not developing nuclear weapons or at least did not have one, Trump would not have come. So here is a, a guy who is not going to use nuclear weapons first because it knows that it cannot win that war. But it is threatening to use nuclear weapons in case somebody tries to do something to it. What that something is, what that where that monkey jumps, nobody knows. But the very fact that the threat hangs, North Korea believes it preserves its integrity, independence, and sovereignty. And if you look at the world today, if North Korea did not have nuclear weapons, then the Americans would have dealt with it differently. So that so so here's a paradox. So that's why we talk about the taboo which says that, you know, eventually nuclear weapons has kept the peace, at least between big powers. I mean, and even in the Indo-Pak situation, I am also quite convinced that if nuclear weapons were not there, we would have had much larger military engagements than what you have had, for whatever reason. But the paradox is that if we keep thinking like this, then at some point, somebody is going to make a mistake and the damn thing is going to get fired, and not that you're going to be affected. Actually, the, the question which you uh, see, the, the, the thing about nuclear weapons is that it's going to, the uh, radiation is going to affect the biosystems, the water bodies, food, and climate are both going to be, agriculture production is actually going to be what it is. And you can imagine, when we have food shortages in the world and when we people with hungry stomachs, what can happen to the world? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the richness of the discussion uh, can be gleaned from the fact that we are 10 minutes over, uh, you know, our scheduled time. Uh, and I, I'm sure that I, in some sense, I've learned a lot after coming to this seminar. And I'm sure everyone present in this room and those watching us around the world would share the same sentiment. Uh, we're grateful to Lieutenant General Menon and Professor Bashrud to have come to ISIS, uh, not only to deliver this talk, but also for writing, primarily writing this very, very useful and timely book. Uh, and therefore, thanks again, sir, for doing this, uh, for, for you know, uh, enriching us, not only in terms of our understanding of nuclear weapons, nuclear politics, uh, the kind of nuclear anxieties uh, you know, which envelop the contemporary world, but also a way out of it. Uh, so with that, we end our today's seminar uh, with a round of applause for our two speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you.